Aloha, this is Bill Best with On Exhibit here in Wailuku. We're at the Bailey House Museum, the Hale Ho Ike Ike with Cece, who is the executive director of the museum. And I, I'm so looking forward to uh, getting a little special tour through the museum. Thank you for taking time out from your, your heavy schedule. It's my pleasure. Aloha. Aloha my everyone. Welcome. And uh, we're outside the building right now. This was uh, built in 1933? Yes. Or oh, 1833. Yeah, 18. 18. <laughs> 1833 by a gentleman by the name of Reverend jo um, Jonathan Green. Yes, from the first wave of missionaries that came to Hawaii. So yeah, definitely. But originally this place was considered the royal compound of uh, Chief Kahekili. So prior to the establishing of this this hale or this home, uh, it was already very, very special. So they were on to us. They were on to us before um, they started to to erect this beautiful place. And I understand that the uh, building was the first Western style building here in Wailuku. I wonder what the other buildings were looking like because it this looks a little bit primitive. Yes, yes. This and the uh, Baldwin House in Lahaina are probably relatively the same time that they were established. But yep, first of its kind, first of its type here in Wailuku. And it was, um, it, it was a, a, a mission, it's been a school. Yes. Seminary, is that right? Female seminary, yes. Yeah. So it was a Hawaiian school that was put together by the missionary, the first company that had come. And the idea was to have these women come and receive an education both in Hawaiian and in English. And they were able to um, learn different, about different, like the kids in school currently, like learning about history and about science and math. And yeah, they were able to do those things. But specifically, just women, just girls. Just girls. And uh, it was um, owned by the Reverend uh, Edward Bailey. Right. So after Jonathan Green had left and gone on to do other things here in Hawaii, and then Caroline um, Edward and Caroline Bailey came from Massachusetts, and they were the second wave of people that had come to take care of the school. And so he and his wife had five strapping young boys, and he raised. They were raised right here in this hale, this house. But at the time, they care took this house as well as took care of the, the uh, seminary. Were there more houses that uh, have no longer uh, survived? Yes. So the seminary itself was a two-story building just past us on the Yoko Uchi property, and that's long been gone. But that is where the girls actually lived and, and had their classes. And I understand that there was um, uh, cane fields too. Was, were they right nearby? Probably right nearby. I mean, here, because um, the, the, the Luna House, which is the Yoko Uchi estate, was o owned and operated by the Waluku Sugar Company, the Luna of that, at that time. So yes, there was the sugar. The museum could have been called the Pondi Yoko Uchi Museum. Well, yes, actually Pondi was very, very, um, supportive in our being able to receive this this uh, piece of land. Um, he, um, at the time, um, well in 57 it opened as a museum and um, he was affiliated but in 1992 he actually gifted us the property itself so we're very grateful to him. Oh absolutely. For that. So uh, there's so much to see and uh, one of the main features I think is uh, this canoe that we have right over here. Let's go take a look. Okay. Tell us about the canoe. Yes, this canoe was actually originated from the island of Hawaii in the area of Kona. And it was brought here originally to be utilized by the, um, the canoe clubs here in Maui. They needed a vessel to utilize. And it was at one point in time, but then it was gifted to us to be on display um, when they had retired it from its actual canoe paddling and had brought it up here to be on, on display for, for visitors and Kamaina. Now, when was this built? I believe it was 19, oh, 1895 was the wow. time when it was built, really? yes, this yes. Is, this is all original yeah, material? Yeah, it's a koa canoe. I mean, it's fiberglass, and, and, um, but yeah, this is an original. And the log was harvested in, in Hawaii, yes. And then these uh, poles on, uh, that we see on the wall, these were counterbalances, exactly. right? Yako and ama, they call it. So this is what helps to weigh the canoe or the, uh, the vessel in the water. So it's, it's um, 
put out and then the the long piece is then fastened so that it it doesn't tip over you can utilize it in the water or in the how many people would uh, would ride in the canoe usually six i believe in this particular one yeah. do you canoe i don't but i ca i have to say and this is a plug for my own ho ohana i actually my my last my my maiden name is Lake, so I come from the uh, Ohana of canoe paddlers. Um, my grandparents are John and Keloha Lake, who actually helped to found Hawaiian Canoe Club here in Maui. And but I can't put my talents towards that. Um, that um, I do other things, but I'm very very um, honored to be a part of that that legacy. Now I notice um, it, uh, on the property it almost looks like there are a couple of gravestones over there. Is that what those are? Oh, actually, those are um, pohaku that were utilized um, on a different part of the property, but not gravestones. Not well, at least not necessarily here. So it was utilized. One was a konani board that was used, utilized to play like Hawaiian checkers, it's called. And there's a couple other um, pohaku that were utilized um, in a mill that was just just across the way on the Yokouchi estate. So this is the pohaku stone, which doesn't look a lot different from just about any other stone I've ever seen. Yes, this is considered a papa konane. And konane was a strategic game, very much like regular checkers, but in um, in old Ho in old Hawaii, we would have utilized it with just two two types of um, colored stones. And so one person would have white and the other one would have black. And so you'd set it up just like checkers. And you know, just again, being strategic and being the one with the most, um, collecting the most pohaku at the end of the game. Yes. So one person would be seated on one end of the rock and then one on the other. And then there would be the indentions within um, within the center portion of this pohaku that would let you know exactly where the, the different smaller stones would be set up. Yeah, I've seen some where they actually had the, uh, the little circular uh, spaces yes. uh, that are somehow ground into the right. stone. I so can't imagine how long that would take. Right, and I'm sure you can tell just by not seeing them anymore that obviously the stone is very old yeah. uh, because it's gone, you know, it's no longer here. But that's what this one would have been used as. And we have a couple of other stones uh, over here. Let's uh, stroll over there for a moment okay. and uh, take a look at those. So these, these stones were actually um, lived on the Yoko Uchi estate at one time, and I believe they were utilized in um, f uh, a mill. And so it would have been utilized at, at the time, not only sugar was produced, but at one time Edward Bailey was trying to produce a wheat, wheat um, mill. And so I believe these rocks or stones were utilized with that and in way of like water and having the awai, which is this is Kama Awai just behind us, would have flowed through. There was an aqueduct system and the pohaku would have been utilized for that. It wasn't that successful. That's why we don't we didn't have wheat, um, of course, you know, production here later on. But at one point it was it was a talk. It was a it was something that was brought to the table. Well, I always hope that Maui would be uh, sustainable in every way, and uh, you know, if we could grow our own wheat and uh, soybeans and all the basic uh, necessities for life, uh, we could tell the world where to go. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Get aloha or forget about it. Yeah. Exactly. Because <laughs> the world needs more aloha. Well, let's step inside and look at uh, some of the uh, the displays inside. It's just wonderful things in there. Okay. So we're, we're going into uh, one of the rooms that have uh, uh, Reverend uh, Bailey's paintings. And these are so fascinating because you can see how uh, Maui looked uh, way back in the days. I mean, we're talking 18... 1800s. Yeah. <laughs> Early 1800s. Yeah. Yeah. 1800s, yeah. yeah. So uh, we're just surrounded by And he's a wonderful artist. Yeah. Um, he taught himself how to paint, and we have actually a photo of him um, here as well, just to show how he looked or how he would have been during his painting um, times. But what's so beautiful is that he's, yes, he's actually, um, we have them on, on hand because so that people can understand the naturalist view that would have been back at that time. Because Yale Valley is no longer how you see it in these images, but just to allow people to step back in time to say, wow, that's how it would have looked, or just the perspective, the scale of the person versus the, the
the valley and, and the perspective looking out into, into Kahului or into, out into um, the other areas. Yeah. So if you come to the Bailey House, you can actually step into the past with uh, his paintings. Um, it, it looks like we have one of the uh, Bailey House yes, and the buildings. Exactly. Let's go look at those uh, for okay. a moment here. So this one is of, um, yes, the Wailuku F Female Seminary. So um, the rendering to the right, the house on the right, of course, is the museum itself. Um, the middle portion of the, um, of the painting is of the exhibition hall that we're going to visit. And then this, the, the building on the left-hand side no longer exists, but that was the female seminary at the time. So his perspective looking sort of Iyuka, so like as if you were standing in Wailuku near Kahumanu Church and looking up towards Iyo would have been his perspective. And right behind us, we have his uh, actual paint kit. And I love that. And there's a picture of him, too, if you can, if you can get a good look at him. Um, he looks uh, remarkably like Rodin, the, uh, uh, the sculptor. Uh, and I saw a little film of Rodin working at one point. And uh, they, they look... Uh, very much alive, alike, and, uh, uh, and it's so exciting as an artist to see an artist's palette and their tools and everything, because that's what you don't get to see when you go to a museum. And we have uh, another uh, painting of Canoe, and uh, this was Diamond Head. Right. So he did not only focus on Maui, but uh, in his travels he would go and paint, you know, like he would have ventured off to Oahu and had gone to Waikiki and, and captured um, Diamond Head, which we know as Le'ahi. So this one here depicts uh, actually standing further back down, like in um, Wailuku or Wailuku, even into Kahului as you look upwards towards Wailuku. And then you see um, the perspective into Iao Valley, which, you know, again, Today, it's nothing like it is in this, in this image, but it is nice to be able to see, you know, what would have been cane fields probably, yeah? Mm -hmm. A lot of cane fields, some, some buildings, some structures up in, further up in EL, but just a simple, simple life at that time. One more painting I want to look at, and that's the uh, painting of Haleakala within. So uh, shall we stroll over there? Sure. So what I love about our Haleakala uh, creator uh, by Edward Bailey is just the color, the simplicity, and then of, again, showcasing in the bottom right corner of the image, you'll see people, yeah? And what it would have, who would have that been? Maybe it would have been a group of hikers. It could have been Paniolo, like, but very depictive of the time, um, 1877, when he would have created this and just. It is, and uh, I, I see it looks like one of these uh, uh, characters is a cameraman. It looks like he has a, a tripod there, and th these folks are kind of sitting and looking off. And the way in the distance, you can see two tiny little figures there. And that's so uh, um, evocative of Haleakala, because you'll, you'll come into uh, the crater and you'll see people miles away, a little... Little tiny figures. Now this um, painting down here, I think it's really interesting because it includes the old sugarcane train, which was quite extensive back in the day and uh, was a major conveyance, not just for materials and goods, but for people, everyday people traveling back and forth. And I always thought it was sort of a mistake that they didn't let the trains continue to this day. They would be like the cable cars in San Francisco. People, everybody would want to ride on the sugarcane trains. Of course, we had one in Lahaina that's not operating much anymore. And then there's another room in here that looks like more of a, a residence room. Yes. So this actually, the gallery, what we call the gallery because of Edward Bailey's portraits, was considered like a, an informal dining room. So this would have been where the family would have come and ate like a meal. And um, as we go into the next room, it would have been what is known as the cookhouse. So um, they would have had... Um, you know, people like the cook or, or various people that would be preparing the meal. And then that's where all the, all the exciting magic was happening for whether it was breakfast, lunch, or dinner, and, and was prepared there. So, yeah. We're coming into the Keone room now. And uh, I see there's, a, there's an old um, wood 
uh, fired uh, stove. Yes. Uh, are some of these still from the original time? Yes, actually, this structure is a is from the original time. So, and this was actually the first part of the the hale or the home that was built. So, Edward, um, excuse me, Jonathan Green started in this area. So, a wood wood burning stove that is you can still see in in the wall, and then. We have a chimney also, but it's inactive, but it still exists, and we still have it on display. And in this uh, case over here, this is a whole collection of shells from the islands, uh, all Hawaiian islands. I yes, and so this, this beautiful collection is from David Dwight Baldwin, and it, what's so special about it is it's our Hawaiian land snails. So these are known as kahuli, and they... Um, where they live is far up yucca in the in the mountaintops and so it's it's so exciting to see them in various you know form color shape style um but now the kahuli is is close to being extinct so we have to malama um, right now they're being um cared for in pu'uhukui up along the ridge at pu'uhukui um so so when i have students that come we always try to kind of you know, talk about that element of uh, mala mahonu or being mindful of things that that are close to extinction, that we have to be mindful of them, know what they are, and, and continue to try to, to, to protect them. So this piece in particular attracted me because it reminds me of some of the modern art that we see, sculptures and so on, but it's actually a demigod. Correct. So this is in reference to Kamapua'a. Um, our demigod, the pig god, and um, the, this is a replica of, of what you can find the original at the Bishop Museum on the island of Oahu. And so this particular piece was utilized as a, as a post, so it, was, um, it, um, it would help determine the boundaries of a particular area. So you would have f found this specifically just um, as, a, as a particular, like, um, uh, yeah, like as a as a perimeter, as a marker. There we go. <laughs> as a marker. Yeah. And um, many of these old artifacts were were destroyed or purged uh, with the uh, Hawaiian culture and the religion uh, back in the day. So it must be very very hard to find anything left over from that time. Yes, it is. Um, and many of them have been taken to museums. A lot, of, a lot of items have been lost to like private collections or given, gone far, far away. Europe, throughout Europe, Asia, um, all throughout the United States. So we're constantly putting the plea out there to those that have items that need to come back to Hawaii. We would definitely encourage that. So again, you know, it's, it's putting the rightful place of, of and honoring these different artifacts and antiquities back to where they belong. And there's so much to look that really in the time that we have, uh, I can only encourage people to come and, and take a good hour and learn the history. It's so important. And there, there are other museums on Maui that you can, you can visit the Makawa Museum and the Hawaiian Museum. There's, but they're small. And, um, and this is the authentic, the real deal right here. Yes, we're partners with the Sugar Museum that's in Kafului, as well as Lahaina Restoration Foundation that has a plethora of different sites that you can visit. And Makawao, Makawao Museum. Up in Baldwin? Here. Yes, and the, yeah, the Baldwin House out in Lahaina. So, yeah, we're constantly um, trying to share and trying to partner with one another and um, showing visitors as well as Kama'aina um, locals that um, museums are important. Yeah, our history is so key and it's so important for not only us as makua or as adults, but for the children, for our kamali'i that are growing in, in such the 21st century when technology is at their fingertips that sometimes they need to put those things down and remember what truly is important. Yeah, things of interest that would have taken years, if not months and years, to fashion or create something and remember that those things are important as well. So this, is, this, this item here is called Le Niho Palaua. We consider this mea vai vai. This is very unique, very special. This would only been, would have been worn by an ali'i. And so this is the actual strands are made from human hair. And we're talking um, like between 58 and 90 strands of human hair that would have been formed, um, the braids that 
create the cola or the or the tie for the for the necklace itself. Then the actual hook that's on the on the front end um, was created and fashioned. And then again, that was just a sign of royalty. And some of these are made from um, uh, birds' feathers that I imagine uh, no longer exist. Oh, correct. Yes, like. Being able to have this OO here, uh, the taxidermy of, of that particular bird, this is not something you can find in, in Hawaii currently. Um, back in the day, I think the people of Hawaii were very, you know, very, they were very conscious about their surroundings around them and the things that they had access to. So they would never just take, take, take in and overutilize something. Um, this bird would have been um, a sap would have been put on the branch of a tree. The, the manu or the bird would have come and landed there, gotten caught. They would, the bird catcher would then just take the, the feathers that they would need, just a, a few, and then unharness the bird and let the bird free. So it wouldn't be like they would kill the bird and then pluck all the feathers off. No, they knew how important that bird was, and so they would want to continue to, to malama and care for it. So that next time when they need more feather, the bird would be available to, to do so. And so going back to the Le Niho Palaua, if you look straight ahead, um, there's a beautiful image of Liliha and Boki. And um, actually, you'll see the Le Niho Palaua on her, on her um, neck. So you can kind of get a, a rendition of, of, of who would have worn such a beautiful, beautiful piece. Some of the most beloved people in our community here in Hawaii are the Kumu Hula. And here in the Hula Room of the Bailey House Museum, you have a little uh, alcove uh, representing the different Kumu Hulas. Could you mention them? Sure, so um, we have a very wonderful, blossoming, beautiful, rich tradition of Kumu Hula that are here in Hawaii, or in, specifically in Maui. So um, we have, we talk about um, Hokulani Hok Padilla and her tradition, the Long family. Um, we capture also um, um, the Beamer family, Auntie Nona Beamer, Winona Beamer and her family. Um, there's a rich tradition of the Lake Ohana, which is talked about with Mikey Ayu Lake and her traditions of hula. And also um, Auntie Emma Sharp, who's from the west side, um, and her, her lovely um, genealogy and history of hula. And we have um, uh, the hula competition behind us on the big screen. And there are some old pictures of the hula. And this uh, dandy, um, I'm trying to remember his name, He's the dandy in the picture with the tall hat. Uh, uh, who is that? Okay, so this gentleman was reminiscent during a time which we considered in, in hula monarchial. So this was during the time of our, of our ali'i, of our monarchy. And uh, this image is of, he was known as Dandy Jim Iowane and his performing hula maidens. And so this rendering comes, or picture comes from uh, the archives of the Bishop Museum. Um, but um, in caption it says, Dandy Iowane was, his, um, was the glory of his occasion. Um, he was considered the floor manager and the master of the situation. He ma marshaled the performing girls in short skirts and hula buskins is what they called it. And accompanied their gyrations with his tumultuous toned uh, instrument which would have been an ipuheke um, probably at that time. So yes, um, some of our native dancers and then uh, Dandy Jim Iwane. Well, he is a real dandy. I want that hat. <laughs> We've been talking with Sissy, the executive director of the Bailey House Museum. I encourage you to come out and visit the museum. What are the hours? Um, we're actually open Monday through Saturday from 10 to 4 and we're closed on Sundays. And you're right here in the heart of Wailuku Town? Right in the heart. Um, we're just above Kahumanu Church. Our address is 2375 Main Street. Come take a picnic and, uh, and you'll learn something about the history of uh, our beautiful island and islands and the culture. It's so wonderful. Thank you for watching. Carl Riziki, thank you so much on camera. Larry John and uh, aloha to all. Thank you.